uh, the mid central region big we had in Louisville, what is that, 2017? Is that? 16. 16. So yeah. 16. So it's been a while. Uh, a lot of you didn't get to see it then uh, because you were too busy running the convention. <laughs> I know. Um, so you guys get a second look at it. If you did get to see it, I've, I have changed and added a few things to it. So don't feel like it's a complete rerun. You know, it's, it's been updated a little bit. So uh, what is this, uh, this Cricket Explorer? Well, this is the machine right here. This is in its travel position, and I'll open it up. Oh, you know. <laughs> With it. So um, it's manufactured by ProtoCraft and Novelty Incorporates, the name of the company. They go by Cricket. You go to cricket.com is their website. Uh, it's pronounced cricket. I have a lot of times with this. I'm a little dyslexic. It keeps coming up circuit. Um, I think we've gotten all those instances out of the slideshow now, but if you see one, yell. <laughs> um, it's marketed as a vinyl and paper craft cutting machine. Uh, Probocraft used to make an older model called the Expression. Uh, it, it is, it's been off the market now for um, several years and is no longer supported. So if you're a yard sale or something and see a cricket think, oh, I found one for cheap for 20 bucks. If it's an expression machine, avoid it. Uh, they no longer, software no longer supports it. You can only use cartridges, can't do your own drawings. There's all kinds of reasons not to have it. Um, unless you're into Arduinos and want to hack into it, there's a project out there with the older machines that do things with it. But for the normal consumer, avoid that one if you see it at a yard sale or something. <laughs> um, and this is the most important thing, and this is how I got into using these machines. Um, if your spouse or significant other is in crafting, uh, you may already own one of these. And my revelation came when I was watching Miles Hale, a video on Train Masters TV, where he introduced this machine. And I was like, dear, didn't I buy one of those for Christmas? <laughs> so there it sat in my basement for six months. Uh, not being used by me. Okay, so how this how does this work? So basically, it's a uh, material. You've got an adhesive mat. Uh, these guys here that hold your material in the machine. Um, you have experience with a laser cutters or 3D printers. You have an X axis, and a Y axis, and a Z axis. Uh, your X axis, there's this little carriage that holds the tool that moves back and forth. Uh, your Y axis, materials move. Your this mat comes in and out of the machine. And the z-axis, you have some control over the pressure of the tool. Um, what tools do you have available? With this model, you've got a drag knife, uh, a pen, you can draw with a pen or pencil, and then you can use a tool to either score or scribe. Uh, there's a special feature called print and cut I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, so basically here you see the machine, kind of an aerial view here. Let's hit this laser pointer. Can you see that? Ooh, not at all. It's great. Well, anyway, we'll have to go to the old finger. <laughs> Um, so the mat moves and out, that's your y-axis, this piece moves back and forth, so that's your, your x and your z as the tool moves up and down. Uh, so here's a quick demo video here of this thing cutting out a circle. <laughs> so what this guy's going to do is going to cut out an 8 inch diameter circle out of a piece of, uh, piece of paper. There's your basic theory of operation. That's how the machine works. Now there's some other tools that go with it. Um, here's the scribing tools I was talking about. This, this is made by a third party. It has a carbide point on it. Uh, this is made by Cricut. It's basically for scoring uh, cardstock and paper so you can fold it. Uh, there's a pen in the tool holder. And this is your, your, your knife. All right. So the, the drag knife, which is probably what you're going to use most often, it's modeled after a commercial drag knife vinyl cutter. So think sign shop. So the sign shops make these big vinyl letters to put on signs and things. This is kind of a miniature version of that cutter they use. Uh, it's not new technology. In fact, they, this Cricut uses a rolling style knife. You can buy third party knives and bring this thing. Just have to use theirs. Uh, right now, Cricut supplies three different knives for this. They have a regular blade, which I think is high-speed steel. They have the German carbide uh, blade. They now call it premium blade. The machine comes with one of these. And there's a deep cut, which is now called deep point, if you go to the website, uh, that we'll be more interested in into um, you know, cutting uh, uh, wooden things with. Uh, the bottom of the blade is two millimeters. It points off center. The nap page will always rotate to the cutting edge of direction of travel. So there's a drag knife. I've got a little demo here. So the way this drag knife works, so here's a big version of it. 
So you see the point is off center, right? It's not actually on the center of the blade. So what that happens is, is no matter which way I kind of plunge it in here, it will turn in the direction of travel. Right? It's going to turn and cut through. So it has no control over how to spin the blade. It counts on that forward movement and the blade's point being offset to cause it to spin in the direction of travel. Uh, that will cause some issues we'll talk about later. Uh, there's two, two holders that go with the drag knife. Uh, you can see the little blade sticking out down here. It's basically a metal cylinder with a magnet in the top that causes the blade to hang in there. And this little thing on the top ejects the, the blade so you can change it. You can see the only difference in these two holders is this one gives you a little more space at the top, otherwise they're identical. And there's a comparison of the regular slash German carbide blade versus the deep cut blade. You can see you've got quite a bit more depth to work with here um, as far as plowing through material. All right, so how does it come around corners? Well, what it has to do, and I put a pin, we're told it was a knife so I can see what it could do, is basically it has to advance past the material and it basically does the spin move to cause the knife to spin in the other direction. All right, so what can I cut with this? Well, you can cut pretty much anything you can cut with an X-Acto knife. Uh, papers, cardstock, cardboard, thin wood sheets, plastic sheets. The thickest thing I've done with it is 1 16th inch uh, basswood. Uh, your limitations is getting it basically in the machine and then how deep will the blade go in. Now, the Z-axis control, this is your materials dial, so basically they have some presets on this dial. It goes paper, vinyl, iron on. Basically, the farther around it gets here, the, the harder the pressure it uses. And then there's a custom setting. This will be important for us here today. So the custom materials, you know, you won't find basswood or styrene listed on the dial, right? That's something you've got to come up with. So basically what I found out for 1 16th of bas basswood, I have to set up a custom materials definition. They have a range of pressure that goes like from 5 to 340. I found a 290 worked for me. And then it can cut multiple times, right? So, you know, make multiple passes instead of trying to cut everything out at once. So you can go 1 to 7. I think the newest software supports 9 times. And then which blade are you using? I found that the deep cut blades what I do. Unfortunately, you generally have to determine these values experimentally. You'll have to, you know, do some test cuts on some material you've never used before. And you'll vary the pressure and the number of cuts and see what works for you. Now the mats, um, there are three adhesive grips of the mats. There's a, a light grip blue, standard grip green, and a strong grip pink. Uh, they come in multiple sizes, and they're cleanable, but they do eventually wear out and are considered a consumable item. So I'll pass some of these around. Uh, so this is a mat here, this first one, this white one. This this is at the end of life, right? So it, it's, it's, it's been run through the machine way too many times. Um, this is the regular grip mat. This is what comes with the machine. It's green. Uh, this is the strong. Uh, let's see, I gotta keep one of these here in a minute. That one. This is the strong grip mat. And feel free you know, to, to, to peel it up and, and play with the adhesive if you want. And, and this is the another regular grip mat. You know, to play with here. So um, these mats, the ones you've seen, are pretty well used. Uh, when you first get them, they're very very sticky. Um, and, and because of the multiple grits, for example, if you put a piece of paper on the strong grip mat, it's not coming off in one piece. You're going to tear it to get it off. So, you know, you want to kind of match it to the material you've been using. Um, now, this is an example of strong grip uh, mat. It's, it's gridded out in one inch squares. Uh, there are also centimeters along the uh, opposite edges. And you can load it in either direction of the machine. You can load this end or, or that end. Then there's the software that goes with it. Uh, it's called Circuit Design, Cricket, Cricket, Cricket Design Space. <laughs> there's three versions of, of it. There's a Windows and Mac version. Unfortunately, like most all major companies are moving to nowadays, it's cloud-based software. If you don't have a connection to the internet, it won't work. Uh, there's an iPad version that can work offline. You don't have to be connected to the internet to cut with it. And there's an Android version that they really haven't been developing much on. It's still considered in beta and it only has limited functionality. They're all free, uh, but you have to have a you have to you know set up an account on their website to use it and do all that stuff like most software these days. Um, 
They all can you connect to the machine. Let's see, the Windows and Mac version you can connect to your machine using USB or Bluetooth, but the iPad and Android versions will connect to a machine with Bluetooth on. Uh, the design space software allows you to do some very basic drawing functions. It has lines, shapes, circles, triangles, and veins. Um, you can do text. You can do any font installed on the computer or one of their supplied fonts, and you can you know, cut letters out just like a sign shop would with the machine. You can upload your own design, <coughs> a DXF file, an SVG file, or you know, an image file like a JPEG. Um, you can do your three functions, cut, score, draw. Uh, you can place where you want to cut the mat, manage custom drills. So. <laughs> We'll look at the software later when we do the demo a little bit. Um, so what I have found, and most people that use this in the hob, ho our hobby, has found that you generally want to do your stuff, like if you want to do a build layout to cut out a building, you want to lay this stuff out first in a CAD, CAD format. The, why you want to do this? Because the way the, the design space software is done, it's done with the mentality is I'm cutting out pieces of vinyl or cardboard to glue something. They're not thinking I'm cutting out a wall and I'm cutting out a window inside of it or a door over here. So it's a little harder to lay that kind of thing out. It basically becomes squares on top of squares on top of other squares that, that are very hard for you to then try to manipulate. Um, the other reason to do it this way as well is to do your own designs outside of their software is if you do a work design in the design space and you want to take it somewhere else, like to somebody's laser cutter and try it instead, there is no way to export your work from this. So if you do it in their software, you're stuck using their machines. You can't take it somewhere else. So we're going to go through a th few sample projects here to show you what you can do with the machine. Um, the first thing is we're going to make some control panel graphics. We're going to make some paint masks. We're going to cut up some ties. We're going to do a building instruction and freight car instruction. Control panel graphics. So we're going to use some indoor vinyl, uh, something called transfer tape. I'll explain that in a minute. A burnishing tool. Uh, and weeding pick. Now, Cricut will uh, will sell you a weeding pick for a nice you know, price and a burnishing tool, a nice plastic burnishing tool. Uh, amazingly, the burnishing tool looks a lot like a tongue depressor, which works fine for that. And this looks much like a dental tool, which you can get for little or nothing, which works just as well. Uh, they've got lots of accessories, which you can usually uh, will sell you for a nice price, but you can usually find something else that'll do the same thing. Um, and basically, this you know this is what the Explorer was designed for: cutting out pieces. Of designs and you know, putting on putting them on something else. So first, we're going to design our, our control panel here. You know, we got got some tracks here. We're going to here switches. You know, the usual thing. Um, now we're going to put it into the design space. Now, the design space. When I say it about doing your own, you know, laying the things out, design space is much better at doing letters than the CAD software is. So usually, you want to add your lettering in design space itself. So here, I've added some some labels. So now I'm going to take a piece of black vinyl and put that uh, on a mat and put that in the machine. So here we're cutting it out. And then we're going to do our lettering in green. So you can see where it cut out all the little letters. And then we're going to do a process called weeding. And that's basically removing. So this, this vinyl comes with an adhesive back on it, right? And, and there's a piece of paper that basically keeps it from sticking to everything. So weeding is the process of removing the pieces of vinyl you don't want from that adhesive backing. So this vinyl, we removed all of here where it cut, uh, is just basically going into garbage. So now we're going to use transfer tape. So transfer tape, basically, it's, it's like a huge piece of strong, uh, clear tape, right? So we're going to use it, and, it's, and this has some nice lines on it to help line things up. So basically, we're going to apply this to our, to our vinyl that we weeded, right? And we're going to burnish it in to make sure it sticks good to it. Now we're going to flip it over and basically remove that adhesive backing. So now, now, now we're looking at the adhesive side. It's live. If you stick it to something, it's going to stick to it now. So now we're going to position it onto our, our piece of board here, and we're going to burnish the vinyl in so the adhesive side is down on the board. right? And then we're going to carefully pull this back at, a, at real tight angles, and that's going to leave the, the vinyl on the board. And then we're going to do the same thing with our lettering. Um, you got to use a little weeding tool usually for this because, you know, the little O's and things in the middle. And I tell you what, you want to make sure that you do the little ones in the middle first and make sure that you get those disposed of because they, they will show up at places you will not believe later stunned the things. <laughs> All right, so we're going to use transfer tape again. This is a little different transfer tape. It's not as sticky 
and it's not as transparent, but it works just as well. Same deal here, we're, we've done our weaning, we're flipping it, we put our transfer tape in the front, we're flipping over, we're moving our adhesive back in. Um, so there you see that the, the top one is after weeding, the bottom one we've, we've, we've taken it off the adhesive backing, it's on our transfer tape. Same, same steps, we take it to our panel, we burnish that thing in, pull it back at an angle and boom, our vinyls go on there. So then what we do is we take a hair dryer to it and it helps <coughs> the adhesive set into our panel and, and then, then you're done. So I have that very big panel here that I made, you guys can uh, take a look at it. There, there's a cricket product for it, for it. The clear one you saw at the front that has all the grids, that, that's, that's a cricket product. Um, also, all your vinyl suppliers also sell other kinds of transfer tape as well. I'll tell you that cricket, line, that cricket transfer tape is very, very, very sticky. So sometimes it's a bit too aggressive for some things that you want to do. All right, so we can use yeah, a simple question back yeah, here. Sure. Please, please tell me, so can you get them at craft uh, shops? Yeah, Michaels. Hobby Lobby and Walmart. There's a section of Walmart for the cricket now. Uh, you can find them all there. Okay. Um, of course, they can be a little cheaper at Walmart. <laughs> and and I tell you right now, the 40 and 50 percent cube off coupons at Hobby Lobby and Michaels do not cover the cricket stuff. Or Joanne, or Joanne, yeah, Joanne and Arsenal carries. So. We're going to do uh, a painting mask using a very similar technique. So you can cut you know, your mask from pretty much anything. I'm going to show you using painter's tape and vinyl scraps. But they also make commercial art ma mask control that will work easy too. We've always seen that um, method where people have done you know, using the dry transfer lettering on a brick wall where they paint it and then put that on you know, one letter at a time and then paint it peel off. We can do a similar thing, but, but this tool makes it a whole lot easier. So I'm going to start out by creating a basically a mask that's a 4 by 2.8 rectangle in design space. So like I said, it's design space is pretty easy to do shape. So rectangle is easy for it to do. So I didn't use that in the CAD program. So now I've taken like three strips of I think two inch wide <coughs> loose fingers tape and put that on a, a light grip mat because I'm putting an adhesive down. If I did this on a strong grip mat, uh, which I've done by mistake, and it, it's a struggle to get it off. <laughs> so there I've done, I've done, put in the machine and cut my, my hole out. So now I'm going to put it on my brick wall and paint it white. So when I'm done with that, I've got this nice white rectangle. So now I found a font online for Windows <coughs> that has this you know, little uh, snow on top of the letters. So I'm making a sign, you know, basically this ice sold here. We'll make this into one piece. So there it is. I've cut that out on the machine. So what I'm going to do is I want my letters to be blue and that part up there is white. So I need to leave the part that's going to be white here and take off the parts that are going to be blue. So we're done with that. So now, now these white areas, which are seeing the adhesive backing, that's going to be blue. The dark areas, which are going to, uh, going to cover the white paint that's already there, they'll stay white. So same technique before. I'm using that, that transfer tape to, to pick it up, uh, then flip it over, remove the backing, Carefully position around my white rectangle there, burnish it in, and then pull it off at an angle and it leaves the vinyl behind. Um, just a tip here, because this, this stuff in here is the vinyl is adhesive, make sure your first layer of paint is dried really well because it could peel it right off the wall if it's still, still damp. <laughs> so now I'm masking it all off. We're going into the spray booth now for some, some blue paint and this past month is the first time I've used these Tamiya spray paints before. I, I, they're, they're lovely. They're great. This is one of some of the best spray nozzles I've ever seen out of the paint. Yep. Highly recommend them. Very stinky. <laughs> Very I, stinky. I, I worked at a four plant for six years near the paint shop. Oh, well. So I, okay. my, my nose you're a new you're immune. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're going to peel off that vinyl you put on there after you let this dry a while. And boom, there you go. There's your sign. Now you can see I, I messed up here a little bit. Uh, I got my mask one brick line too off, so I left some white down here. And here's some underspray where I originally did, did the white. If I were to do this over again, I'd probably make the white a little smaller than the blue since the blue covers the white so well. So, you know, no big deal. I did a little eraser to erase some of that and then masked off the bottom, and now it's really done. So, took care of all that. So, and here's that very sign. Hmm? That looks fast. What, what, what scale is that? 
Um, <laughs> that's, 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 well, the, that's 2.8 inches tall. It's a 2.8 inch by 4 inch rectangle, right? So it's, these, are, these are HO scale brick sheet. But your limitation is going to be the size of the letter you cut. And I'll talk about that. There's some slides about that here going forward. So well, my wife's got one of them, and she cut me out some of those 15, 16. Yeah, they're, they can do some tiny stuff, but there's yeah. some limitations. So, so we can take basswood and do something really similar with it. We can make railroad ties out of it. So, you know, they want what? You know, it's like 27 or you know, $30 for a bag of you know, sugar pine railroad ties. It's crazy. But, you know, I can use one sixteenth inch basswood. I can make a, a, a narrow profile, narrow gauge tie in O scale. I can make almost a, I can make a full size tie in HO for narrow gauge. You can make low profile. You can do a lot of stuff with it. And this is really, really simple. Um, you know, there's your layout for railroad ties. It's a, bu it's a bunch of rectangles. That's all it is. So in design space, like I said, you can uh, you know, upload your own designs. So there I am uploading the image in there. There you go. It's all set up, ready to cut. Um, but this is where you need to use a strong grip mat because you're using basswood, and then you add extra masking tape for security because this machine can rip it up clean off the, the mat. Um, so you load the machine, cut it. That's pretty simple. And there you go, a whole lot of pile of railroad ties out of probably you know, 10 cents, 10 or 3 quarters worth of basswood. You know, glue, you know, usual thing, glue the home salt red bread, you know, lay your track, there you go. That's, that's right there. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> now let's get on to some real, real stuff here. So, building instruction. So basically, um, you can kind of make your own kit. This is especially a good technique if you've got to make the same building over and over again, right? So you can pretty much cut pretty much anything with this that you normally would use when you're doing a building. You can do basswood, you can do styrene, but what you'll find with styrene is that the thicker styrene, um, you know, it takes a lot of passes to get through it, so it's more often a sword and snap operation. Uh, Matt board, I've done some work with cardstock, and Bristol and Stathmore paper. So, there's a demonstration that started working on this ON30 annual station. So in the 2014 edition of the ON30 annual, there was this little this, this uh, station they built. And they supplied the uh, drawings for it as a separate PDF you downloaded. Well, lo and behold, I, I discovered that I imported this into a piece of software called Inkscape. And it turns out that the drawing on the right-hand side was actually a line drawing. I was actually able to, it wasn't an image, I was able to pull that in Inkscape then they actually export it as a drawing exchange format and pull it from my CAD program. So I wasn't I didn't have to redraw the drawing. I was able to extract it right from the PDF. And then I you know made some, you know, they had to do walls they didn't show and made some places where it would cut a little better. So the first time I did this, you know, you know, stuff cardstock is cheap cardstock is cheap. And things from that get more expensive as you go up from there. So make sure I had all the cut laid out, I did cardstock first. And you can see I got a couple places marked. Well, it turns out I duplicated that line twice. And it turns out the machine actually faithfully cut the line twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like, well, that's not going to work out so well. I had to go back and fix that. And there's a couple of those uh, cardboard cutouts I had. So, bass, uh, the, the clapboard basswood's not, not cheap. You know, the, the sheet, especially a six-inch wide sheet. So... My next cut trial cut I did in, in mat board, which is you know big, big sheet for you know seven or ten dollars. So um, so I did that cut next in bass uh, in the in the mat board. That allowed me to check and make sure I didn't do anything silly like you know like overcut this into a wall or you know the things didn't quite line up right. And I was able to you know take all those parts out of the cut and went ahead and assembled it with some balsa and said, hey, here's the final structure. I can kind of mock it up now and see what it looks like. Uh, and this is also a great way for you to do mock-ups of the structure on the layout, just to see if they're going to fit or for a placeholder for later. So now, I've, you know, now I've made a placeholder of the shell. I can see if it fits. Now, if everything's good, I can go out back, go back and commit it to my actual uh, bass, basswood clapboard. So one of the tricks on the clap, clapboard is that you know you want all your clapboards to line up around the corners. You know, if you, if you cut it, you know, off, you know, at an angle, it's going to look kind of silly as you go around the corners of the house. So what I did was, you know, you've got these, these little lines here, so I lined up that make sure my clapboard bottom was on that line. So that allowed me then to line up the drawing on where it was going to cut at right at the bottom was right on that line, so I knew all my clapboards would line up correctly. So there it is when it's, it's finally cut out. Now, 
The thing is a basswood, it's a natural product, right? So it varies from batch to batch, and even from one sheet to another, it can be thicker on one side, a little thinner, or denser, or not so denser. So sometimes it'll cut all the way through it, sometimes it won't. So in this case, you flip it over, you can see, oh yeah, you cut through there, and there, and there, but over here in the middle of it and stuff, it didn't cut quite all the way through. No problem, just take your exacto knife or other sharp knife and just go over the lines and, and pop them all out, right? Just usually just one light cut, it's free. So here you can see I lined up all the walls and said, yeah, look, my, 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 my uh, clapboard's all lined up pretty good. And then took off the new pieces. And now I'm going to do the roof. So since I did this, had this in a CAD program, my little roof pieces here, I can just take the top of the wall in the, in the, the CAD program and make the same piece. So I knew my roof, I could have exactly the same angle the walls were. There was no, it wasn't going to be any doubt. So let's cut that out, you know, glue it together a little, you know, CA and activator, and there you go. So, a few things I still need to do um, with this guy's. I, I need to cut the trim pieces that go around the side, and I need to do some shingles. Um, shingles I haven't gotten very far with. Um, I'll pass around some of my shingle experiments. <laughs> <laughs> you guys take a look at. Um, I'm not going to pass around this house. It's a little more fragile than the, the basswood. I mean the mat board. And uh, here, here, I forgot to bring these around. Here's the examples of the vinyl and the transfer tape you did earlier. Feel free to play with peel and backing off of it and stuff. It's all scrap material. Okay, so we go a little further. Let's make a freight car. So we've got some limitations. You know, you're not going to be cutting out, you know, a foot wide beam or something. You know, best we can do is maybe about three inches and one sixteenth inch uh, bass weight. Uh, can't make notches like a laser cutter. That, dra uh, that drag knife just can't make those tight little notches. And uh, I found this in, uh, in looks like the mid-June 1980-something, can't tell on the resolution, um, Narrow Gauge and Short Line Gazette. It's an 18-foot flat car built for the Yosemite, <coughs> Yosemite, oh, yeah, Yos Yos it's Yosemite, right? Yosemite, Yosemite short, short Line car. So it's, it's beams and stuff for you know, nine by three, so it fit well with the dimensions of the basswood. So, there it is all laid out. So it doesn't look very attractive at this point. It's just a bunch of rectangles, right? That's what the car is, basically. It's a bunch of rectangles. Um, I did some little work here, like, like these are uh, the centers of the bolster. So I marked those as circles, and I'm gonna use the scribing tool, basically, to go ahead and pre-mark my drill points, right? So I can have those precisely in the centers. When you're done with that cutting, you can see there's my little marks. I put some uh, art marker on there so you can see them uh, for the uh, bolsters. And then, since I was going to make a few of these, you know, side topic, but I went to Shapeways and had to make me an assembly jig for it, right? So I would go crazy holding all these little parts together. And there it is, all put in there so I can glue it all together, and, and boom, there it is, there. There's the finished uh, frame. So I need some details, and also need a freight card deck. So I couldn't find one 32nd inch material six inches wide, so I had to make the deck in two pieces, right? I, because of the grain, you don't want your grain going opposite, you know, the long ways on the deck, obviously, you want to go with the boards. Um, you can see there after I cut it, the little art marker, so you can see where it's scribed in with the scribing tool. And then the, I need some little bolster braces, so this is really tiny and laid out, um, laid out in styrene, so there's where it's cut. And then you can look at these that are like a half inch wide, not very big at all. There it is in the finished model. And then I had a bunch of steak pockets and nut bolt washer castings put on this. And, and I'm horrible at measuring and, and you know, repeating stuff over and over. And I said, well, why can't I make drill, drill templates with this too? So basically, uh, you know, I had to put a steak pocket, four steak pockets on the side. So I said, well, why don't I lay it out here in my cab program where the holes are supposed to be? Then I use my pins, the sharp, a little. Um, Precise V5, which is kind of a very, very tiny ballpoint pin. You know, it's got a very precise pin. And what happens is, is when it pushes out, I just told it to make a 0.001 diameter circle or something. So it doesn't really move, it just kind of jams the pin into the cardboard. And so now I've got my little drill marks perfectly marked on there. So this, this is basically the side of the car. I can now line it up and tape it on the side of the card, on the car, um, use the sewing needle in my pin vise to go back in here and mark all those holes. So now I've got them inside the car, go back and drill the holes I need, and boom, 
there they are, same place every time. So I can take that, take that template and put it on each frame I make and put my, my state pockets, those holes in the exact same place every time. There's the final car with all these, so I use that kind of technique on all these nut bolt washer casters on the end. And there's the finished car painted. And then I did the same thing with the tank car, uh, very similar variations, the same, same frame as some supports I also cut out of the cricket to hold. So I'm gonna pass, pass that frame around. You guys can take a look at that too. So a lot of stuff was sacrificed <laughs> before we got to the point where I got really um, working well with this. Um, so just some stuff I've run into. So it doesn't do inside cor corners, it doesn't do corners well if you tell it to, to do a square, like, like I showed before. It makes these little turns in the corner. So if you want good square corners, you need to, to extend your lines out, right? So it makes a straight pass on each side. And it also allows time for when the, the knife plunges in here and decides to turn, gives it some time to turn and straighten up. It's also best to, to do more passes with less, less pressure when you do the custom materials for the same reason. You want the knife has to be able to turn if you jam the knife into something real deep, it's, it's, you can't turn. So what happens if you do these inside corners with squares and not, not straight lines, as you can see, where that knife goes up into the material past your cut, it turns it, knocks a piece out of the corner, and then keeps riding and going. Um, the other thing I learned is that, that draw your lines on the same direction. The machine seems to honor the direction. So the line has a start and an end that seems to honor <coughs> those. And what this does is, is you have no control over the order it cuts, but when it goes to another line, uh, if it's the same direction, then it doesn't have to turn the blade, right? It's already pointed in the right direction. So that helps a lot with, with it not uh, knocking little pieces of wood out of your, your board. Um, and then the other thing you've got to watch because of doing this, um, if the drag knife winds up picking up like it's, turkey, it's going you know, right to left, and then picks right up and tries to do something left to right. Well, it's trying to turn the, the knife 180 degrees. Um, bad things are going to happen. <laughs> and bad things do happen. So, so here, the knife plunged in too thick. It, it was supposed to draw a, a diagonal line. Well, it went in too too thick, and you could see it didn't turn. It just kept going straight, <laughs> and then decided to bump up this way. And then here, I made the mistake. If, if any of you are familiar with the CAD program, there's a mirror function, right? So I laid out this, it's supposed to be the end of a box car. Well, I wasn't thinking I laid out one half of it, then I used the mirror function to make the other half. You know, it's a mirror image. Well, at the same time, that makes, means this line cuts from here to here, and this line cuts from here to here, not in the same direction. So what happened was, it cut this line, goes to here with the blade almost 180 degrees backwards. Well, it didn't want to spin. You can see where it skips, 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 you know. And then down here, it just went in 180 degrees backwards and crushed the material. <laughs> so, so that's just something you got to think of is that, you know, that, that knife is spinning, so you don't want to go in too thick and you want to try to keep the blade in the same direction all the time. Um, oh, then make sure you leave one quarter of material, inch of material around the cut, because if the knife falls off the edge of the material and comes back at it, well, it's going to rip it right off the mat because it has enough strength to do that. Um, now, the, the, the knife has a curve, right? Those are those railroad ties I cut earlier. You can see the end of it. Well, you can see the knife is not you know, nice vertical up and down. It's, it's, it's at an angle, so you want it with that angle on the end. So if you want a square cut, you're going to have to cut long and sand it, right? If you need something that's perfectly square. Um, and then as far as dimensions, that the, the side that's down against the mat has the most accurate dimension, right? That's what it's, it's going off. That's where the little tip was, and up here it's going to be wider. So that upper side is going to be smaller than you intended. And then your circles, they come out a little conical. Um, you know, the top and bottom, because of its nature, are kind of shifted. And that uh, tank car frame that's going around here, those saddles actually had a sawtooth on them. Um, because one side was higher than the other, so I had to sand those out to be smooth. Uh, your mats, you um, basically get material off them, you want to curl the mat and not your material, otherwise, you know, you peel that piece of paper off there, it stays curled forever, basically. Um, and then the mats can be cleaned, 
um, you know, the wild hack, they, they are great at picking up all kinds of stuff. Hair, dog hair, cat hair, your hair, air, dust, everything. Um, so they will you have to be clean from time to time. They come with a plastic cover on them, and it's a good idea to keep that on there because if you, you know, don't store it with that plastic cover and adhesive up. You, know, you come back a month later, it's, you have every piece of dust in the house on it. Well, uh, you can use soap and water. There's something called Totally Awesome Cleaner. People recommend use Clorox Clean Life wipes a lot. Um, there's a bunch of YouTube videos. Everybody's got a different opinion on doing this, but but like I said, eventually they are consumable. Eventually you wear the adhesive out, or you cut through the mat, or you know the mat breaks, and you'll have to buy a new one. Um, so to keep the mat sticky, you know you, you can clean your material with a lint roller before you put it down. That way you're sticking to your wood, not the dust that's attached to the wood. Um, solid roller like I have here, they make sure it's stuck everywhere. Always, you know, the extra tape the whole thing's on. Like I said, store the mat with the dust cover to keep dust from adhering to it. Um, then keeping your machine clean. Um, I mean, we, I've, I've abused this one pretty well. What happens is you get little pieces of wood and plastic all over the place. So I like to use painter's tape to basically, you know, tap around it to keep it picked up. Uh, you want to vacuum it out, not blow it, or else you're going to blow these little pieces all into parts of the machine. Um, and even the little blade holder, especially if you're cutting plastic, and if you take the end of it out, you'll find lots of little pieces of plastic on the end of it that stuff from static, so you need to clean that every once in a while. All right, and then there's these evil rollers I had on here. So it took me a while to figure out I could use those, but they're, they're, they're like, got little teeth in them, and they would actually leave a, a little trail of holes in a 1 16th inch piece of basswood. So I had to, I initially I had to set my cuts up so I didn't have anything in those little gouges until I ran them form somewhere. Just, no, 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 they're not glued on. Just, just slide them, slide them one way. Okay. Um, so I said, there's, yeah, there's limits to the curve radius. Um, you know, that's what we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And this machine, you got to remember that mat's going in and out, right? So if you've got 12 inches of mat here in front of it, and you're going to cut something towards the front of the mat on it, then it's going to stick 12 inches of mat out the back. So you can't just set this machine up against a wall and expect it to work. Um, you also got to make sure it's clear behind it, because I've you know, had paints and stuff set behind it, and it pretty much does a good job clearing the table right behind it. It shoots, it shoots the mat out. All right, so how small I can cut? So I had, when I first did this clinic, somebody asked me that question. I said, well, I don't really know. So I did some test circles, did some different things to test. And you can see that you know this is point two. These are radiuses here. So quarter inch radius, it's a half inch circle, cuts pretty well, and then you get down here, it's like, well, you know, is it really doing anything down here? So, you know, digital microscope, I blew this up a little bit, so it looks like a .02 radius is about it. After that, the blade just kind of spins in place, it just doesn't really cut. Um, same thing with squares, it looks like a .04, you know, square across cuts pretty well, anything smaller than that, you know, you're just going to get a little, little spinning in place in the blade. Triangles, you know, well, no, same thing. 0.04 triangle cuts pretty well. Smaller than that, forget it. Then I tried something with parallel lines, and, and something interesting happened here. There's my 0.04, but look, my 0.02, 0.01, I can still see that down to 0.04, it's still cut little slots out. And even down to 0.01, you can see where it positioned the knife that far apart. It's just the, the, the knife has so much slop in it, it just dropped into the same groove once it started moving. So the machine is capable of positioning to very, very precise locations. It's just that the drag knife has a limitation that it can't handle, you know, it can't cut things that small. Okay, so um, normally I do the demo over here, but I'm going to move the demo to the end. So right now there, there have been five machine models on the Explorer. Uh, Explore, the Explore Air, both of those are out, those are original machines that are out of production now. Uh, there's an Air 2, an Explore 1, and a Maker. The Explore 1, I'm not certain, it may or may not be discontinued, or it may show up again at Christmas again. It's their, their lowest price model, it's the model I have here. Uh, and the pricing, least to most expensive, the, the Explore 1, the Explore 2, and the Maker. And the Maker does the same thing, but a whole lot more. Um, and it's priced accordingly. So the maker is like three hundred and fifty dollars right now, street price. So I've got one at home, but I'll, and if anybody asks about it, I'll tell you why I don't necessarily recommend you go run out and buy one right now. Um, like I said, the first two models are discontinued, but you will still find those online, Craigslist, you know, eBay and stuff. And they're perfectly functional machines. It's just that you know, Cricket has superseded them since then. Um, 
the big thing with the the um, it's more Air 2 in the one. Uh, the one had Bluetooth, you have to use an add-in module. Um, it only has one tool holder, and it can't cut, it, it doesn't cut as fast as the other two. So there's the Bluetooth module I was talking about the one has, and this is the difference between the one and the other model, models, is that the one has just this one tool holder. Your pins and scriber and knives all go into this one holder, which means when it has to change tools, you have to stop. Here they have two holders, one for the knife and then one for the pins and scribers and things. So if you're using just two tools like those, then it doesn't stop in between those and you have to change it, it just keeps going. A um, little bit of internal differences, we have to talk about that. Um, so if you can find one, assuming that they're, they're still in production, they do show on Cricket's website, but you gotta dig into their shopping page. They don't you know, put on the main check page with their machine comparison anymore. It's the least expensive, I found some, there's been some alignment issues between the two holders where they don't exactly line up sometimes. Uh, for the kind of cut small road new, you don't really need that you know, double speed. And then sometimes I have some doubts about that separate pin holder for scribing. We'll talk about that later. All right, so where do I buy this thing? So, okay. So don't pay full retail. You know, Michaels and Hobby Lobby's carry them, but the weekly count coupons don't apply to certain cricket items. Uh, Walmart and Amazon usually have the best price, unless is having an online sale, uh, and if you go and find a cheap price on Walmart, just buy online and pick up the store. Because I found a lot of times that uh, last year, like that Explore One, was 179 in the store. You go look it up online, Walmart line, it's a 140. Where you can say, hey, I buy it online and pick it up in the store. And they go to the shelf and grab the same machine that's $179 and mm -hmm. sell it to you for 140. Um, Craigslist. You will find these on Craigslist all the time because people get these as gifts and then don't want to take the time to use it. So this is especially a month <laughs> after Christmas, <laughs> a month or two after Christmas, you'll see a lot of them on Craigslist. Uh, well, I think I got my first one on Black Friday, maybe, and then I, if I remember it, might be a good time to look Right there, so between, yeah. So, so Cricket.com will occasionally have sales on clearance and stuff that's discontinued. For example, this one here, it's a, it was a discontinued coral color. They're big on colors now. If you go into Michael's, you'll see a whole row of displays where the machines are different colors. They're all exactly the same machines, it's just these pieces are different colors. Um, e eBay, you'll see a lot of these on eBay, and I've been noticing that, that that used to be they would never go for less than $100, but lately I've been seeing some for $75 to $80. The thing, if you do go to eBay, eBay is watch the shipping, because some people will charge anywhere from $20 to $5 to $50 to ship one of these. So that really negates your, your bid price. You have to bid accordingly. Um, bundles. Now, this this is interesting. So, Cricket will sell these with a bundle, right, of, of accessories, of vinyl, and some images, and tools, and things. And some of these bundles don't sell well. Like, um, I was looking at Walmart this week, trying to look at some pricing, and there was, like, some sort of wasabi bundle with a bunch of stuff. I didn't care about all that. But the machine that came with it was cheaper than buying them. The, buying that bundle was cheaper than buying the machine by itself because they're wanting to get rid of they have a warehouse full of these bundled machines and we get rid of them. So that happens from time to time. And then Thanksgiving to Christmas, that is when these get super cheap. Apparently Walmart and Amazon buy container loads full of these for the Christmas season, and you'll see the price drop dramatically between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then when you buy one of these with accessories, well, you're going to get the deep cut blade in the housing, you're going to get a strong grip mat, uh, this engraver I'm going to show you, uh, use is available from a third party. Uh, these are kid sharp pin adapters on eBay. A lot of you use different pins other than just the cricket pins, which are awful expensive. You can just use a ballpoint pin if you want. Uh, like I said, you can buy a weeding tool for cricket, but you know a dental pin will work just as well. Um, spatula, you can get the spatula at Dollar Tree. You now rollers, you can use an ink roller, a you know, rolling pin, a dowel, an art roller, whatever, just something to push that mat stuff down on the mat. All right, resources. I've got handouts for all these if anybody wants these. I had all, all the links and things. So, uh, Model Railroad Hobbyists, there's a bunch of stuff in the discussion forums there. Just go and search on Cricket. Uh, this is the original video from Miles. For those of you know, Miles used to be a division member here before he moved to Kansas City. Um, this is a free video on, on Train Master TV where he introduces this machine. There's another video with him later in 2015, but that's a, that's a paid one. 
Uh, there's a special book Facebook group, Modeling with the Cricket Explorer. Many, many, many crafting groups on there that you probably do not want to be a member of. <laughs> Let's just say that some of them are a little more estrogen heavy than others. <laughs> um, there's, there's some stuff on YouTube, a bunch, a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Um, and then vinyl transfer and tape supply. So Cricut will sell you vinyl, right? And you go to Michael's and sell you vinyl. But you can get vinyl online for a lot cheap because they sell it in sign companies too. You know, basically, they're taking a humongous role, pulling off yards for you, cutting it off and shipping it to you. So my, these are both good places. This place here, 651vinyl.com, is actually here in Louisville. They, ha they are off of, um, I think, Old Shep near, uh, near, near you know, the old GE facility. And basically, you can order online and drive down there and pick it up. You get the same price online. It's great. If you, if you get, get in, you can use And then there's an article in Garden Railways Manual. Yeah. So, so, me not leaving good enough alone. <laughs> so, I have this machine. What can I do with it? Well, one of the things I kept running into is that this, this is a 3D printed pin holder I got off of eBay. Well, what should happen here is here's a cut. And there's where it's drawing an X. And those are supposed to line up right there in the middle. Well, they don't, right? So this is causing when I cut something and then draw something, it would, they wouldn't line up right. So, you know, me having machine tools and 3D printers and stuff made a different pin holder that I could line up using screws. And there, it got lined up pretty well. Why did I want to do this? Well, I couldn't get these freaking dots on this flat card deck to come out in the right spot. <laughs> so there you go, nail holes. And then I thought, well, why can't I shove other things in the machine? So I, I made, the, you know, why, why, why can't I have a collet to do that? And I said, well, well, here, I got a Dremel collet. Why can't I make something to do that with? So I came up with this thing that I could uh, shove anything I wanted in there. And this is a, this is the point of the general scri scriber pin, right? You can buy the replacement points. It's carbide. So, hey, what, what happens if you draw a zero point, uh, you know, a zero diameter circle with a, with a carbide tip? Well, all it does is plunge it into the material and pull it back out. So, rivets. I have a machine making rivets. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, have we done that time? We're, what time is it? 3.30. So, all right, so I'm going to um, get the machine fired up here, and we're going to cut out a, a, a basically a little outhouse in a little row scale. Um, going to be hard for you to see in the back. So, if anybody wants to come out up here and take a look, that's cool. Um, if anybody's had enough and wants to leave, you can leave too. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to machine via USB. Which means something's got to go here. I don't know, ports. Maybe not. There we go. All right, we need the software fired up here. Right. Um, the pointer up there? Yeah, unfortunately. Okay. So the, um, like I said, the Cricut software is web-based. So here's our, here's our little outhouse I already have pulled up in here. You've got your two in walls, you got your back wall, you got your front wall, and of course, of course the roof. So I'm going to take that uh, strong grip mat. And I have a pre-cut uh, piece of 132nd inch basswood. I think we got six by four, maybe it's eight by four. I'll see if we can fit it on there. And we'll stick that on there. It is actually eight by four. So it's stuck on there pretty well. But I'm going to add some tape to make sure we don't have any accidents while we're doing this. Oops. Yeah, this is basswood. This is just a sheet of plain 1 16th inch basswood. Now, basswood I've found the most common sizes you'll find are 1 32nd and 1 16th inch sheets. There are some 364s floating around out there. I think Northeast makes it, but it's very hard to find.
Now, notice uh, there's numbers across the top, and we've put this between the 4 and the 8 at the top. I'm about to cover up a piece of tape, so we can remember that. And then down here in the side is between the 0 and 8. And this will become important in just a second. All right, so now I've put tape around it, so hopefully it doesn't come loose from the mat. We're going to fire up the machine. Hopefully it will cooperate here. And there's little storage compartments in the front, and this is the tip you got to remember, is make sure you get the tools you need out before you put the mat in, because otherwise you can't get to them after that. That's like uh, voice of experience. Yes, very much. <laughs> if I were paying attention, you'd see it again. All right, so I'm going to go over here and tell it I want to make I want to make this now. So come over here. Oh, no, 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 get over here. All right, too far. All right, so basically I have different color pieces of vinyl and sort them out into different colors. So so you you, know, you put a piece of color on there, it cuts all parts of that color off, and it goes on to the next color thing. So this really doesn't have a color. We're just cutting it out. So. So now it's going to say, well, okay, so I'll put it up here in the corner, but we know we put our sheet over here between the 4 and the 8 and the 0 and the 8 over here. So what it allows me to do is I can pick up this whole drawing here, click, select, select on it, and I can move it over to where I actually have it on the, the mat. So now it's where our <coughs> piece of wood is. And the reason they, they allow this is that, um, you know, Sometimes, like when they're cutting vinyl, you'll have an odd-shaped piece or a scrap, so you need to move it over into that piece of scrap, or allows you to move pieces around so you can get more efficient cuts out of it. All right, so we've positioned it. Now we want to say, I don't want to find my mouse and see what I did with it. There we go. I'm going to continue. So now you got to connect to your machine. Well, I only have one machine connected to this, so it should. find it automatically. There it goes. The first thing it wants to do is, is to set material. So you have the dial, but then one's on the dial, but you know the basswood, so that's that's my defined material up, up there. And you can see when you go into this uh, section here, you can say, hey, let me see all the materials available. I got a lot of stuff in here. Art boards, card stocks, fabrics, foam, iron on, leather, there's your material, stuff I've defined. Paper, so there's a wide variety of presets in there to use. But there's mine, basswood wood 16th inch. So it tells me, hey, you've got lines on there that are going to be scored. So basically, we're going to make, we're starting with a blank sheet, but we're doing scribe siding. So I'm going to take this, this tool first which basically has a little carbide point on the end of it. Can't really see it there. And it's going to go in the machine first, and I'll load it in the clamp. Is that the Cricut tool, or is that the one you That's the Chromos, uh, Chromos, a Chromos has that one. Uh, so now it says, okay, you've got, I've loaded that in, and now it says to load the mat. So this little button's blinking on the front that says, hey, we're ready to load. So there's a couple of uh, pieces here. It's got to go underneath of it and up against the rollers. There's a little button. It sucks it in. I should say, say you're loaded, you're ready to press the go button. That's going to do its thing. Puts up there at progress and tells you how long it's doing its thing. Now, see how the mat kind of flops towards the front? One of the things I've been wanting to do is like take some PVC pipe and make a couple of supports. Because what happens is, is that mat curls. I got a big plat PVC some basket on there. It's wanting the Pull it off the mat. Do you usually use it with off the table though? No, no, it's usually it's usually on a, a much larger table. Yeah, if they got this little machine like I'm saying before, well they gotta allow at least you know twelve inches if you're using a twenty four inch mat, you know, four feet <laughs> to use the machine. So right now it's just scoring, right? Right now it's just scoring, just cutting those vertical lines. You see the dash lines. Those are the ones that are scored. So it's making essentially the scribe siding out of the blank sheet first. And then it's going to stop until you need to put the cutting blood in. Yep. Okay. Now, I'm realizing I just made a horrid mistake. I select 1 16th inch basswood. This is 1 32nd inch basswood. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead. Well, no, it is scribed. 
it, but but I will probably have to stop this before it finishes the cu the cut because it's probably going to make more passes than, than I'm going to make in one sixteen. Mm -hmm. But I've kind of already committed, so we'll I'd see what happens. Like you can't change it now. I can't change it now. Okay. I mean, I can stop it entirely and change it, but I've already started, so yeah. I might as well see what happens. Okay. We can always wait another man. Hmm? My coach is mad. How many passes do you have it set for that? Four. Four passes for that. So here's pass one. Once I got past the mentality of, of, of trying not to draw shapes and instead drawing lines, it went much better. That it, it was a mentality change because I, I had a lot, you know, these, these things where it was doing the corners. I had a lot of disappointments where it's like, well, you know, I'm trying to make something square and it's coming out, you know, perfectly like a parallelogram because they chew the corners out. And then once I got out of the mentality of saying, saying, saying that, hey, let's just worry about making lines, not squares, lines, it went much, much faster. And, and I've done um, I've done a lot of stuff with it. Um, for example, this um, where's that building I had? Probably Here it is. Okay, it's past one, I think. Right? Yeah, it's past two. So, all right. So this building here, which is a, a skid shack for a logging camp, I mean that's all that's all cut with the grain. So it started off. As plain, all this is plain basswood and describing, and all these little pieces came out of it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know how to say how long it, it took. It maybe took me a couple of months of, of doing it, but like I said, it was that, when that revelation hit of saying, I should be making lines, not shapes. It, it, it all went much better after that. And, and then I don't know how many, you know, guys and gals in here know your background, but score. Or the ones that maybe aren't anywhere close to being as computer savvy as you, and Fred, Barbara, uh, uh, Ron, uh, then uh, again, big learning curve to know the program. To no, the program is very simple okay. uh, as far, far as, as, as this cricket stuff. It, like I said, it is oriented towards, okay, we're coming to park, so that's probably the last pass. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, like I said, it's it's oriented towards crafters with with little technical skills. So so the software itself is very easy to use. For me, it's probably more frustrating that that I you know want the software to do things that it can't do. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it's, it's probably the big bigger frustration. Um, it's like why can't I adjust, adjust the pressure of the scriber? Well, they don't allow that. You know, they, there's no feature for that. it. Okay, so it allows you to pause it anywhere in the cut, right? You can resume it, or you can go ahead and eject the mat and cancel it. So, so if something happens, you know, you're watching it and suddenly a piece of, the, you know, something flies off of it, you know, the mat, you're like, no! <laughs> you know, go, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and eject it because it's, it's, it's cut, cut through, it looks like everywhere. So ideally, I, you know, I take my tape off, Right, so I bend my mat back, and I should have, you know, it looks like most of it's cut through. Well, how about that? Yeah. So there's your, uh, I mean, the cool thing, it does the half moon pretty well. The crescent moon. Oops, in the front. So there's, there's your front door, and your roof, and your back, and the two sides are almost cut through. I could probably just pop them out. Yeah, pop right out. And there's your two sides. Now, of course, if I'd selected the right material and I'd do its thing, you wouldn't have that fuzzy part, but it's no big deal to, you know, scrape it, cut that off. So, 
you know, if I wanted to make you know twenty or thirty outhouses that were all the same, I could keep shoving material in this thing and cutting outhouses over and over. So, all right, well that's the extent I have. Uh, I've got a lot of models and stuff up here. And I've you know made some stuff with. I'm gonna look at them. Uh, everything that's up there is, is seen is, is here today. Um, and who who wants a no scale outhouse kit? <laughs> Seriously, I, I, okay. I made a little dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I made a little dirty. Yeah. <laughs> I can use that.